Hey everybody, we're gonna go ahead and get started and get this loan update. I've got Paul on with me. He's uh, muted and he's actually looking up the current loan forgiveness application expiration date to see um, what it says. We were just discussing that with somebody else. So I'm gonna give everybody a couple minutes to get uh, logged on real quick and then we'll get rolling. I should have broadcast a little bit quicker, give everybody time to get on. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So my name is Amy Knight with Knight CPA Group. You might know me as Amy Taylor, that's cool too. I still answer by that name. And once again, I've updated my slides and I see I missed my date down at the footer. So I'll fix that before I print them into final form to send them out. Um, so I will send out, you'll get a follow-up email from me that will be likely tomorrow. That will have the slide uh, presentation, the, PDF of the slides in it as well as a link to the recording so it's being recorded and I'm just going to triple check that it is and so we'll put it up on our YouTube channel um, so you can go back and uh, replay it or share it with friends or refer it to family whatever you need to do so here we are and yesterday I felt like you know I think we're getting to the end of all these changes and I scheduled this about a week ago and it was like you know finally we can kind of get like the final out there and then yesterday we start hearing tweets from Marco Rubio about wanting to make some more not changes as it exists now but maybe another set of real another relief package to small businesses um, and then maybe they're trying to the, the small banks are up lobbying right now trying to get anything less than 150,000 to have automatic forgiveness it's not happened yet but they're working on it so anyways there's still a lot of changes going on so we'll keep doing updates as we need to uh, more about our firm we are a CPA firm located in Austin Texas I'm originally from OU uh, no, I'm not from OU I went to OU I'm from Oklahoma and uh, I still I still fly my flags proud down here in Longhorn territory and I'm not scared of them and um, we have our firm we only do home health hospice and nursing homes that's the only uh industries that we service assisted living fits into that as well and so a lot of what i'll be speaking about is specifically geared to that audience however I'll, most of it applies to everybody so don't feel like if you don't fit in that demographic that you uh, you know aren't going to get value out of it so i hope to bring value to everybody listening sorry turn my phone on mute uh so let's go Let's get started. Now, I will say I am using sl slides by Google instead of PowerPoint for the first time. And I also have polling questions that I'll launch for the first time. So we'll see how that goes. Oh, another reminder please put all of your questions in the Q&A section, so the question and answer box, as opposed to the chat. Um, I do have chat up and, and, and I'll use that, like if people lose sound or something, that's kind of what that's for. But Q&A allows us to actually tick them off that they're, um, <laughs> UT fans are not very scary. <laughs> I got Paul on mute. So he's a big UT guy. Anyways, um, we can take them off once they're answered. It helps us stay really organized. And I'll try to get through uh, the materials within like an hour, maybe a little bit over, so that we've got lots of time for Q&A. And I'll stay on as long as you're answering questions. Um, we always do. So feel free to put them in there and we'll get them all answered. Um, so I've got this disclaimer. I'm not going to read it to you, but I'm not an attorney. And if you haven't engaged me, you can't rely on, you know, you can't say I'm giving you advice. So um, real quick, we're going to go through, I'm going to, you know, blaze through 
eligibility, what are the eligible costs, how the PP loan works, and get to more of the details of the forgiveness because um, that's what everybody's mostly concerned with at this point. So I'll breeze through some of the beginning parts so we can dig a lot deeper into the forgiveness uh, areas of um, what, what, what we're covering, as well as I did include, um, and I will definitely go over, this does have all the new law changes that went into effect at the beginning of last month, which is June, which is why this just feels so weird because, I mean, it was only, it feels like a week ago that I did this presentation and it's now been almost a whole month, so time is flying by. So original intent of the PPP program is to give two and a half months, and it should be two and a half months, I fixed it somewhere, and apparently it's not on this copy, two and a half months of forgive of payroll expenses to be used originally over a two month period. And now that's been extended to 24 weeks instead of eight weeks. So, but the intent was to put money in the hands of the small businesses so they could retain their employees and maintain employment levels and pay levels during the pandemic and not lay everybody off. That was the original intent. Now, mind you, that was happening in the later half of March. Well, in the later half of March, nobody really understood how long this was going to last and how long we were going to be locked down and shut down and not being able to operate our businesses. So things have changed drastically since then. So at the beginning of June, a, a Flexibility Act was passed to really help make some changes to what the original intent was to allow for more time. So again, the intent is still the same, that the intent is to keep businesses from having to lay everybody off and to keep people employed. Um, but they did, nobody expected it to go this long. So we are where we are. So um, of what they gave you, Originally, they were only giving you eight weeks to spend it. So in addition to payroll costs, they were going to let you use it for allowable rent and utilities and mortgage interest. And so um, that those other non-payroll costs could not exceed 40% of total spend of what you spent. But it was those were eligible costs as well. So it wasn't strictly related just to payroll. But the original intent really was driven around payroll uh, by the name, obviously. So what was eligible for forgiveness was mostly, it's entirely right here in these four bullets, but it's mostly payroll expenses because 60% has to be spent on payroll. And by payroll, they mean salaries, health insurance, and retirement. There are some caps uh, for people, and we'll get into that in a little bit, but for the most part, it's going to be your payroll cost, uh, the employer section. It does not include your employer payroll taxes, okay? So that's the one piece of your payroll cost that it does not include. It also includes interest on real and personal property loans and rent or lease payments for real or personal property. So your office lease, but also like a car lease if it's in the business name, uh, equipment lease, copiers, computer equipment, and then utility payments such as, you know, which include gas, electric, water, trash, telephone, internet. Those have all been clearly identified under utilities by the, by the SBA under this program. So non-eligible expenses is going to be compensation to anybody who did, whose primary residence was outside the U.S. So if you've got, you know, a, a large company um, and you've got people, you know, even if you have people who are how, like, let's say you're up in Michigan and you've got staff in Canada as our primary residence, that their compensation will not qualify. I think those are going to be few and far between, but it's there. Um, and I'm sorry, I really tried to mute all of my things. It didn't work. Um, also, any individual who has compensation in excess of 100000 that's the big cap that we're really uh, playing with here, is that any individual that is 
paid more than 100,000 annualized, the excess will be excluded. Only the excess is excluded from forgiveness calculations, not the full amount paid to them. And so you have to annualize that out and we'll get to that a little bit later as well. Um, anybody, if, if you were able to pay anybody or under the uh, Family First Coronavirus Response Act, the first legislation that passed that extended the sick paid leave and the family emergency medical leave, if, the, if you were paid under that where you then got a credit on your tax, on your payroll tax return, those wages are also excluded because you're not really paying for them. The government's already paying you back for those. And then any um, expenses not listed above um, as an eligible expense. So moving right along, the um, earliest that a forgiveness application will be accepted is 56 days after the PPP loan was dispersed. However, I will tell you right now, the banks are not, the banks I'm talking to are not accepting applications yet. And we've had people lapse over that 56 day. So they're just not ready yet. And I'll again, get to that later. Um, the SBA did put out and everything that's been put out, the guidance put out is interesting. It's not on the SBA website, it's on the treasury website. So if you go to treasury.gov, that's where you're gonna find the most useful information. At the top, they've got a red bar. It's not super big, but it's a red banner. And it says, you know, click here for more information. If you go there, it'll take you to the page all about PPP loans and it's got all the forms, all the instructions, all the FAQs, all the interim final rulings, everywhere where I pull my data, it's there. Um, and so they in initially released an application, then they came back on June 16th with a revised application and they also included an easy form. And we're gonna go over that because I feel like most of our audience being home health hospice nursing homes will qualify to file the easy form. So we're going to not really dig into it too much. I'm going to really talk more about the um, eligibility, the, the, the mechanics of the, the qualifications and the rules around forgiveness, not the technicalities of filling out the form because it's kind of self-explanatory. So um, that's how we'll run into it. So there's also been additional um, guidance that's been issued. And so everything that's come out new is has been incorporated into uh, the information that I'm giving to you today. So on June 4th, the Payroll Protection Flexibility Act was signed into law. And these are the, these are, I say the major changes. Fortunately, it was a very small piece of legislation. It was very direct and it had no extra crap attached to it. And so this is the only thing it included. So these are all six of the changes that were made. So first, the big change was it extended from eight weeks to 24 weeks for the time in which what they're calling the covered period in which you have to spend that money. If you put yourself in the shoes of a restaurant, that's what I keep going back to. Just think about the restaurants that can't open, you know, Texas let them open for a little while and now they're, they're not totally shut back down. Although they did shut down the bars and some bars are fighting that. So anyways, they, they shut down and so they couldn't open yet, it, you know, and they may have got their loan in early April, well, early June, they weren't even opened all the way yet to be able to spend all of that money. So therefore the need to extend the period in which you could spend those funds. Um, they added more exceptions and safeguards to the forgiveness reduction rules. So yeah, there's this forgiveness, but you got to meet certain qualifications to, to qualify for that forgiveness. And there are what they're calling reductions to your forgiveness. And again, we're going to spend a lot of time on that, but they added more safe harbors and exceptions to those rules that are very, very favorable to um, everybody out there. Uh, they also changed the requirement that originally stated that 75% of your loan of what you spent had to be on payroll cost. And now that's dropped down to 60%, which therefore means up to 40% can be spent on those non-payroll costs that we went over that were eligible. It changes everywhere where it references in the act, the original CARES Act that references 630 has now been changed to 1231 and which coincides with this 24 week period. 
And they've also loosened it up that there was a payroll tax deferral option where you could defer the Social Security match portion of your employer's payroll taxes. You could defer that for 50% um, of it until next December, another 50, the other 50% 50 until December 2022. Um, if you had a PPP loan, you were excluded from taking that benefit. That, ha that exclusion has been removed. So now, even if you have a PPP loan, you can also defer your payroll taxes um, under that option of the CARES Act. And it changes all the new loans are now five-year terms instead of two-year terms. Um, so those are the changes that were made um, in early June. Okay, so we got our first polling question. Let me get over here and launch it. Again, it's my first time. Launch polling. All right, it says it in pro it's in progress. It doesn't show on my screen. Um, everybody's voting, so apparently you're seeing it. Um, did you receive a PPP loan. And if you did, I've kind of put in some different segments. Under 150,000, between 150, 150,000 and 2 million, more than 2 million, or we opted not to apply. Um, and I will say while we let this flow through here, if you opted not to apply and you're here because you're interested in something, unless you just like hearing me talk, um, there is talk right now going on to ex the application date uh, expired yesterday. They are, there is a bill working its way through legislation right now to extend that to August 8th, which will be an additional five week period. So we'll see what happens with that. So that might open back up. Give it a few more seconds and I can take a drink of water. All right. Looks like everybody's done and I'm going to end polling and um, and I'm sorry I, I cut a lot of people off. Uh, the, only about 60% of everybody on. Um, oh, let me share results. Voted, uh, but it was well over a minute and again, I don't, I can't see what you guys see. So it looks like 16% um, got less than 150,000 and then the majority which is 47 percent was between 150,000 and 2 million which is what we're seeing for our client base and our people that we're you know just everybody we're working with and then um a couple of people got over 2 million and then a couple of people opted not to apply all right well that's great and i think i just closed that thanks for participating in that um so that's interesting because that matches kind of what we've seen. We've got a few that are under 150,000. Majority are around about the $350,000 mark. So um, it's just kind of good to know what everybody's uh, got out there and, and how, how, to, how everybody applied for it. Okay, as we discussed, the covered period is now either eight weeks or you can elect to extend it up to 24 weeks. I will say, and, and also just of note, the the change of the new act the flexibility act was anything issued after six five or later is automatically 24 weeks and it automatically gets those rules well it's the 24 weeks and then it's automatically five year term now for those of you that got, got your loan prior to six five and you're on an eight week plan we've seen and heard nothing from banks telling us what do we do to elect a 24 week the banks have been very very loose on this and it's kind of like well just keep spending until you need to we're going to assume everybody needs 24 weeks and the fact that they're not accepting applications for forgiveness yet it it just don't stress over that just keep spending you know don't worry about trying to rush everything in by that 56 day mark just go ahead and spend it out naturally and then when you do file for your application there is a period a covered period and you could fill that in for the 24 week period um this as it currently reads it says it's all or it's it's either 
eight weeks or 24 weeks, but nothing in between. We have gotten clarification from the banks and actually through I'm trying to remember if it was an IFR or in the FAQs. I don't recall. I think it was an IFR. An IFR is an interim final ruling. Um, but anyways, it did come in and state that you, if you elect to go 24 weeks, you don't have to wait until 24 weeks. You can apply for forgiveness at any point. So that cleared that up a lot. And then um, there's this thing, and I'll, honestly, I think I took it completely out, where you have a covered period, but then you could elect an alternative payroll covered period if you were a bi-weekly payroll. It's really irrelevant at this point now that you've got longer time to spend. So I think I took that out of the presentation altogether because that no longer really matters. One of the big victories that we got, and this was earlier on before the big changes that came in, was the clarification of paid or incurred. And they were very favorable in the way they came in and said, you know what, we're going to allow anything paid and anything incurred during the covered period. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because, again, now that the time's been expended, extended, it doesn't matter as much because you can just go with everything paid wait till you've paid all of your loan out and then apply for forgiveness. If for some reason you wanted to pick a cutoff date, what it means is if you've got a week left in that period since, since your last payroll, but it's been incurred, but not yet paid, you can count those days in your forgiveness application. So again, it kind of starts becoming a moot point with all of this being extended to 24 weeks. The date paid is going to be either the date on the check, if it's a live check, or the date that the ACH is uh, initiated to go to the pay uh, the bank account of the employee. So if you work with a payroll provider and they draft, let's say your check date is Friday and they draft your account on Wednesday, the pay date is still Friday. So that's the date you send the transactions to the employees, okay? And the date, the date incurred is the date that the hours were actually worked or supposed would have been worked by the employee. So again, if you're not in healthcare, or even if you're in healthcare, and let's say you've got attendants and they are not working, but you're still paying them right now um, because maybe their client won't won't allow them access to the home, but you want to pay them anyways. The incurred date is the date they would have been scheduled to work, and you are allowed to do that. There is nothing that states the employee must actually perform services for you to pay them. So here is that $100,000 cap that we discussed, and what does it mean to be annualized? Well, the law reads, um, the law reads, okay, I'm, I'm reading my own notes. I'm sorry, I did this presentation a couple days ago, put it together, trying to be super prepared, and now I'm forgetting what I wrote down. The law reads that $100,000 a year but if you're only looking at a, let's say, an 8, 10, 12-week period, what annualized means is doesn't mean you can cram in $100,000 to one person during that 10-week period. You've got to annualize it. So to annualize it, you take $100,000 divided by 52 weeks. What is that annualized? If you look at this last bullet point, it's $19,000. Um, sorry, $1,923 per week is what people are allowed. So if you're um, on an eight-week period, they're only allowed $14,835. If you're on a 24-week period, you're allowed, they're allowed $46,000. That's a huge difference. However, it's going, it's going to be capped out at $1,923 per week, depending on how many weeks you use to spend the money. My advice here, and those of you that know me, I'm not super conservative. I would just play by the rules and be conservative here. Don't try to game the system. Um, just allow the 1923 per week for each employee and do it for however many weeks you're going to use until you apply for forgiveness. And you'll be on the up and up and everything will be kosher. Now, 
owner's payroll cost has a little bit of a different calculation. If you're using that eight week period, the amount of forgiveness requested on an owner can only be eight weeks worth of payroll, which is that number we've always been talking about of 15,835, and that's across all businesses. That is not, if they've got three agencies with three PP, excuse me, PPP loans, that cap goes across all businesses. The banks are going to be checking for this. Um, if they've elected the 24 week, it converts, they start, they quit talking about weeks and now they're going to talk about months because in the original calculation of the loan amount, if you remember, they did two and a half months of payroll. So they're saying, okay, well, we're going to give you two and a half months of owner's compensation. And so two and a half months is taken 100,000 divided by 12 months, multiplied by two and a half months, which is 20,833. So if you're an owner and you're elected in the 24 week, you can pay yourself up to the $20,833, again, across all businesses. Um, a shareholder, owner, employee, they are capped by the amount of their 2019 employee compensation, employer retirement, and health care contributions. So I highlight this because for employees, that 100,000 annualized cap only applies to actual payroll wages, wages, bonuses. You get 100,000 annualized cap plus you still get to count their health insurance premium that you pay for them and the retirement that you pay for them but on an owner the health insurance pre, uh, pre cost and the retirement cost is included in the cap okay so those are some really strict uh rules around the owner's compensation that's allowable for forgiveness now when I, you know, back on the last slide, when we're talking about owner's compensation and self-employed, there, there's a little bit of differences here. Um, owners in an S corp or a corporation are treated as owner employees. Self-employed individuals or partners in a partnership are treated a little bit differently. It's not drastic, but it's a little bit different. If you're an LLC, it gets super complicated. You need to find out how are you taxed? How does your LLC file its tax return? There are, I mean, really four ways. You could be a single member LLC and be disregarded entity, which means you file your LLC business files on your schedule E, but on your personal tax return. It doesn't file its own tax return. Um, that you could be, you could elect S corporation status, which would then make you an owner employee. You could elect C corporation status, again, owner employee, because now you're treated as a corporation. Or you could be, uh, elect partnership status and be treated as a partnership for tax purposes. And then you would be treated as a general partner. And these rules apply to you here. Um, Again, it's not, it's not drastically different. It gets kind of technical, so I'm not going to dig into that. Um, and and it, it's all basically the same, just a little bit different on how you calculate it. So you can uh, refer back to that if you're one of those owners. So again, this was the bad news that came down uh, late April. We found out that the IRS said, okay, cool. So the CARES Act says that this debt forgiveness is not going to be included as income under a 1099c cancellation of debt that's cool but what that also means is the expenses paid with that tax-free money cannot be included as tax deductible expenses so that was a backdoor way of basically saying anything you get forgiven is now taxable so the amount of forgiveness that's granted is basically taxable income. 
and for all practical purposes, Paul, which I didn't really introduce, Paul Alvarez is CPA here at our office, is what I call my tax guy and our tax manager. He's really director of client services. Um, unless he tells me otherwise, we will just be recording for our clients an income of, ta of forgiveness, and we'll call it you know, forgivable, I mean, uh, taxable income. And I actually did put some slides in at the very end to go over the accounting rules that we were going to follow for these funds. Um, so that was not Congress's intent. There are a lot of people up in arms about this. There were talks of trying to get this change. Um, I haven't heard anything on it lately, though. So let's start diving into some forgiveness. And wh what, what does that even mean? So forgiveness means that, right, because what you have right now is you have a loan, and it is a loan, and it needs to be a loan on your trial balance, on your financial statements. The bank gave you a loan, you signed loan documents. So you have a loan until they forgive all or part of it. And so the forgiveness piece of the act says that the full amount of the loan plus the accrued interest can, it can be eligible for forgiveness. Um, you cannot have more than the full amount forgiven because some people took this weird approach in the early days that, well, the more we spend, the more we're going to have forgiven. You know, if we spent it, if we spent qualified experiences in that period, which was a short period, if we spend more, we'll get more forgiven. No, that's not what it meant. It means up to the loan amount plus accrued interest can be forgiven if it's spent right. Um, the forgiveness is filed directly with your lender. It's not filed with the SBA. Um, I had some interesting language come in from, we've got one bank we worked with quite a bit and uh, it was funny how they phrased things. So I kind of clarified on that, um, but it is applied for with the lender. And again, it can be 50, you can apply 56 days after the loan was received, but nobody's taken those applications yet. Uh, but no later than 10 months, again, 10 months is a bit of a change, 10 months after the covered period. So if you've got the extended cover period of 24 weeks, once that date comes and goes, you have 10 months to for, ask for forgiveness. If you don't apply for forgiveness during that period, they will assume you are not seeking forgiveness and you will your payments will become due. Uh, the lender has 90 days to determine if they're going to give grant the forgiveness and they if they say no for any reason you can appeal it by uh, up to the SBA so the calculation is this I couldn't find a better way to put this in here um, total so you take your total el eligible expenses okay during that period, whatever your period is, but your total eligible expenses, you have to reduce it by the reduction that is due to the salary and wage reduction rule. We're going to get to that. Then you, and it needs to be in this order, which is favorable to you. So don't worry about trying to calculate it in a different order and see if you get a better result. Then you reduce it again by the FTE reduction rule. Then you reduce it again if you did not meet 60% payroll cost rule. That's going to equal your initial forgiveness amount. If you received an idle advance, that was that $1,000 up to $10,000, that grant or advance that was given on an idle loan. If you receive that, you've got to reduce your loan forgiveness by the full amount that you received in an idle advance, different than an idle loan. This is only the advance part, not the full loan. And then that's going to be your final amount for forgiveness. So let's do super easy. You had a $100,000 loan. You spent $100,000 on eligible expenses. And you have no reductions because we're going to get to that in a minute. So the, you know, those three reductions, you're good. You had a $10,000 idle advance. So you've got $100,000 of initial forgiveness. You're going to reduce it by the $10,000 idle grant or advance. You've got $90,000 eligible for forgiveness. Now remember, they already gave you $10,000 for free. So really, you've got $100,000 for free. You're going to have to pay back $10,000 of it. So that you got... 
110,000 total, you're getting to keep 100,000 free and clear, you're gonna pay back 10,000. That's how the rules read. So what are these reductions that we're talking about? So the reductions are if you reduced anybody's salary, either their total salary or their wages, their hourly rate, um, more than 25%, you get a reduction, dollar for dollar reduction. Um, if you reduced anybody's, um, any full-time equivalents, so if you laid people off, you're gonna get a reduction for not restoring those FTEs. Uh, now, if you restore them, that's one of the safe harbors. We're going to get to all of that. This is just an overview. Again, if you didn't spend at least 60% of your total amount spent on payroll, you're going to get a reduction in that. And then the idle grant, idle advance reduces forgiveness dollar for dollar. So the salary and wage reduction, um, first of all, it excludes anybody over $100,000. So if you've got somebody making $175,000 and you reduce them down to $100,000, their 25% reduction doesn't start until you get it down to $100,000. So then, then you can go all the way down to $75,000 and then it starts counting against you. Okay, so if you take your high compensated individ individuals, you, re you can reduce them all the way down to $75,000 thousand before you start taking a haircut on your forgiveness. Um, it's a reduction in the employee's salary or an, a reduction in the employee wages, which is their average wage rate. It's not their average total pay. So this is very, very important for our audience because if you think of all your attendance and you say, well, somebody normally works 30 hours a week at $9 an hour, but they only have 10, 10 hours a week now, but they're still at $9 an hour. The hourly rate is what is important here. We got guidance on that and it was favorable to us. So again, like I just said, it reduces any compensation of your over 100,000 down to 75,000, but anything in excess of 25% starts at what we're calling a haircut and it's dollar for dollar. So let's say you had a really highly paid person, you reduce them from 150,000 down to 70,000. Well, anything below 75 is more than 25%. So now that 5,000 more that you reduced from 75 to 70, you get a $5,000 reduction on your forgiveness. Okay, now the comparison period is the first quarter of, of 2020. Um, and so that's, that's the, pay, the period in which you're gonna compare their wages to. All right. So this is the clarification that we got that said, okay, we understand that there are a lot of hourly workers out there and you're gonna be facing a reduction by cutting their hours or by their hours being cut because business drops. So we don't want you to be penalized twice because if you if their hours get cut, you got the FTE haircut. We don't want you to also have a wage reduction haircut. So we're only counting if you drop their hourly pay rate, will you get a penalty for that? So that this was all good news for us. And that came out and they said no. And they said, we're going to apply this calculation first, which is more favorable than, than applying the FTE calculation first. So what are the safe harbor and exceptions? Did I, did I pass the exceptions? No. Okay. So the exceptions, well, there are no exceptions on the way, salary and wage reduction, I, I apologize. So the safe harbor is basically stating, okay, if you gave somebody a big wage reduction from 215 to 426, as compared to before 215, or as compared to 215, you have until 630 to restore that, which also now is 1231, okay? So you, have, you can restore that, that's your safe harbor. If you did give them a haircut during that period and you restore it, no penalty. However, what if you did the, the reduction after 426? 
but you restore it. That's not mentioned in here. So that's currently a problem. We'll have to see how banks handle that. I'd like to say if you restore it, you're safe. Uh, we'll, we'll see. I, I haven't seen anybody other than highly paid individuals that have had to, had to reduce their wages drastically. Um, so moving on to the FTE reduction. So the second rule uh, reduction to the forgiveness is this FTE. And this can get super, super complicated, and I'm not going to dig into it too much because they've really added some exceptions that really make it, uh, most people are going to fall into one of these exceptions. So no time belaboring uh, what the rules are. But basically it said, you know, you can't just, if you, if you go lay off, you know, a bunch of your workforce, you're going to be penalized for that. And so there are all these periods that you got to cover. You know, you got to calculate your baseline FTE. Your baseline FTE is FTE for the period of basically this time last year, so 215.19 to 630.19 to 219 2.29.20. One of those two is your baseline. You want to pick whichever one's a lower, lower FTE count. And then you're going to compare it to current FTE counts. To calculate your FTE, you're going to divide by the average number of 40. They, they went with a standard work week. 40 is full time. You can use an alternative method that says for anybody that works 40 hours or more, they count as a one. Anybody that works less than 40 hours a week, they count as a 0.5. They try to simplify it. To me, that doesn't simplify anything, especially if you have a volume, a high number of employees. Just take your total payroll hours divided by the number of hours in that work period, which is typically going to be 80 hours. Maybe there might have been 88 hours in that work week, not week, but pay period. Just take it straight off your payroll journal. So again, you're going to calculate your baseline FTE, but then you're going to calculate your FTE for each payroll period during the uh, your covered period. And then there are these safe harbors. Again, I think a lot of this is a moot point, so I'm just going to keep rolling on through because I'm going to get to an exception and you're going to go, oh yeah, well that fixed me. So exemption number one is if you, you can exclude any reductions in your FTE count if you try to rehire people. So you've laid people off or you didn't have work for them. I'm thinking attendance here. Think of your, you know, caregiver, your um, personal attendance. You had a lot, you had to lay them off because there was no work and you've try to bring them back on. Well, you know the story just like I do. They're, they're on unemployment now and they're making more money on unemployment so they have no interest in coming back to work for you. If you have a good faith written offer that you try to rehire them at the same rate for the same amount of hours and they rejected it, that covers you. You need that to all be in writing and you need it to be documented. Um, and then also note down here, you've got 30 days to notify the unemployment office that that employee rejected being rehired because they want to try to kick them off unemployment. Exemption number two, and, and that exemption was already there. For, it's been there for a little while. Exemption number two, you can exclude any reduction in full in FTEs if the employee was fired for cause. You're not going to be penalized for not having them replaced. If they voluntarily quit and you haven't replaced them. If they voluntarily request reduced hours and you didn't find somebody else to pick up the other those hours, you're not penalized for any of those. And then this last one came from this new paycheck Pro Paycheck Protection Flexibility Act, and it states, and this kind of ends up being a big blanket, and this is where I think it's going to cover a lot of you all, you don't have to count any reductions that happen because A, I, I kind of did these backwards, I like to read them, this bottom one first, A, you cannot find qualified employees to fill positions. So if you cannot find nurses or attendants or caregivers to come in and fill those positions, you're not going to be penalized for that. I know a lot of people are stressing over that. Or the blanket statement is, if you could not restore your business back to full operating levels due to COVID-related operating restrictions, 
then you don't have to restore that FTE and you're covered and you don't have to count those reductions. So let me rephrase this. I feel like, especially as a PAS provider, especially as a hospice provider, um, and, and even home care provider, if your patient will not allow you in their home, the nursing home will not allow you in their facility to provide care, your business is down because of that. Therefore, your hours are down for payroll for that. Therefore, your FTE is down for that. That's kind of, an, uh, I don't want to say get out of jail free card, but that this statement covers you if that's your scenario on why you've had a reduction in FTE, okay? So I don't think, I think, unless you've intentionally laid people off or intentionally reduced wages more than 25%, or lastly, and I don't think I actually have a slide for it, um, we'll get to this safe harbor. Basically, this safe harbor states if you restore those levels back by 630 or 1231, again, that's a safe harbor and you don't have to have a penalty. And then lastly, it's the 60% payroll cost as long as you spend 60% on payroll, you, which we are a very labor intensive industry, I really don't see any reason why you can't get 100% forgiveness. Unless you just didn't spend all the proceeds. I mean, that's one thing, you do have to spend it to get it forgiven. Um, it was originally written that this was a cliff. If you didn't spend, like if you got a $100,000 loan and you didn't spend at least 60,000 on payroll, then none was forgiven, and that's not the case. You can spend fifty nine thousand on on payroll, and it they kind of prorate some of it, so it's not an all or nothing cliff anymore. Again, other changes from six five um, is this: the loan is now a five year loan instead of a two year loan. What they've done, and I'll I'll explain. Any new loan is now five years. The government or the legislators wanted everything to be converted to five years, but the bank lobbyists were there saying, uh, no, thank you. The banks do not want these books, these interest, basically interest free, 1% interest loans on their books for years to come. And so they lobby to keep existing loans at two years. The law reads that it can be extended to five years, but you need bank approval and the banks are not approving that. So if you do have some that stays on as a loan, it's gonna be most likely at a two year, unless you got it in June, then it, it'll be a five year loan. Um, other changes, again, that payroll tax deferral option, you can now do that. In a nutshell, you can take your payroll taxes, you know, your payroll tax equation is this is only for the employer portion of your social security which is that 6.2 so it's the big number so 6.2 percent of your wages can be deferred until 50 percent of it to, um, until 12 31 2021 the remaining 50 percent is due 12 31 2022 and that is on any wages incurred between 327 this year and 12 31 this year so basically you can just kind of bank all those wage the payroll taxes and then pay them out in the next two years um, that is done through your payroll processing company or whoever does your payroll. I'm not answering questions on how to technically handle that. I think it could be a bookkeeping nightmare. So I would be very, very careful on that one. Um, idle grant, again, it will be required to be paid back. If you got that, it's, it's gonna reduce the amount of forgiveness that you're, you're allotted. So let's go into polling question number two. And it is, um, polls uh, okay how do I next oh, hold on oh okay sorry guys launch it was still on question one all right so there's uh, polling question number two based on the rules of forgiveness do you feel like your business will be eligible for forgiveness of the PPP loan 
Um, and so I'll give everybody, and, and the answers are simple. Yes, 100%, yes, but not 100%, or no, we don't plan on asking for forgiveness. So I'll let that uh, come in. We've got 113 people on live with us today. So we'll see how many, we got about half have answered. All right, we'll give it about another 10 seconds or so. We got about 70% answered so far. All right, I'll just close that down, share the results. Looks like about 84% of you uh, that voted do plan to get 100% forgiveness and maybe about 16% will get some, but not 100%. And nobody said they're not going to ask for forgiveness. Thank you very much. That's good. Okay. Um, all right. So moving right along. So the application. So they, they, they came out with this easy form. And I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about that because, again, I think most of our audience is going to uh, qualify for this easy application, uh, which is going to save everybody a lot of time. Mostly it saves you time on calculating FTEs. So to qualify for this, you have to, uh, there are different qualifications. You have to mark yes to at least one of these scenarios. Number one, either you're self-employed, independent contractor, sole proprietor, and have included no employee wages on your borrower's application. So you got to think back to how, what did your, your borrower's application look like? So if, if you did that, then you get to fill out the easy form. Or number two, you did not reduce wages more than 25% and you did not reduce number of employees during the covered period versus first quarter after considering the exemptions and safe harbors. Or number three is you, I'm stuck, I'm stuck a little bit. I'm not sure if I worded that right. Or number three is you did not wa reduce wages more than 25% and you could not restore operations back to the same level as pre-COVID um, because of the operational compliance, the safety issues, right? So if you could, so I did do that correctly. So number two was more about you're able to fully operate, you're not shut down in any way, but you meet the FTE reduction based on one of the other rules. Either you didn't have an FTE reduction or it was because somebody quit and you haven't replaced them or somebody was fired for, for a reasonable cause or you offered their job back and they won't come back, then you're gonna qualify under number two. I think part of the reason in segregating it like this is to see how many applications fall into each of these categories. And then this number three was, you didn't reduce wages, and, but, and your FTE is down because you couldn't restore your operations back to full capacity yet. So if you meet one of those three, which again, I think is gonna be everybody in our group, you get to do this easy form. What goes into the EZ form is your demographic information. So, um, you know, kind of basic stuff. And it also asks for the amount of your idle advance. It also asks for the idle um, advance, like application number or something. And I'm thinking to myself, oh man, I hope everybody has that. I don't know. We'll see what happens <laughs> if they don't. Uh, but it, it's got the forgiveness calculation, which we'll go over in a minute. It's got, and I'm sorry, this is not formatted very well. Um, oh, it's kind of falling off the page here. Forgiveness calculation and then the borrower certification. So you've got to go through. Now you are certifying those, the qualifications that you just met on the previous slides, what qualify, what the means by which you qualify to fill out the easy form, you have to certify under penalties of perjury and all that good stuff, okay? And then um, I did put a link in here to where the um, 
application is found, again, it's on that treasury.gov website. So I just did a screenshot here, and hopefully it's not too blurry. This is what the calculation area looks like. I didn't screenshot the demographic section, all that. This is, this is the meat of the application. Um, you're going to put in your payroll costs, your other costs, your you know mortgage interest, lease payments, and utilities, and then you're going to reduce. You're going to total it up. You're not calculating any reductions in here yet because you can't do it if you had the um, wage and the salary wage reduction of 25% or more, and you can't use this form if you got an FTE reduction. So those aren't on here at all. But this last one, it does have the 60% requirement. So you're going to put in your loan amount, and then you're going to divide it by 60%, or you're going to divide. I don't like the way they did this. They're divide. <laughs> It's a mathematical thing, and I'm left-handed and can't, and I'm very good at math, but I cannot get my head to go the way they want it to go. To me, I take the PPP loan amount, multiply it by 60%, and say, okay, here's 60%. Did I spend that much or more on payroll cost? They do it a weird way. Just follow the math here. Anyways, that's how you get to forgiveness. So that's how simple it is. Um, so with that, I'm going to launch my last polling question, which should say polling question number three. As you can tell, I am the admin, the sales and marketing, and the administrative assistant all rolled into one, and proofreading is not my forte. I need to do better um, on these things. Um, okay, so let me launch the next polling question. All right share let's see launch here it comes okay do you feel like your business will be eligible for the easy form of the forgiveness application so this one i'm kind of curious i don't know what it'll look like so one is yes thank you baby jesus or no unfortunately we will have to do more work or i'm not sure because this all may be new to you um i'm gonna let that roll in what i've found is you know, I'm, I'm staying up with these changes by means of other CPAs in my network. And um, there's a group of us about, there's about six or eight of us really staying on top of all of this. And right before I came into this webinar, I asked uh, any news, any breaking news that I need to know about. So we're keeping each other up to date on this. But what happens is I learn something and I get used to it, I get it all digested, and I assume everybody else has already heard that news, and um, that's not necessarily the case. So some of this may be all new to you guys. Um, so I'm, I'm trying real hard to get it out to everybody. So, all right, it's been a minute. We've got about 70% participating, and so I'm gonna shut it down in just a few. All right, looks like everybody's done. Let me share the results. Looks like about 68% are, think that they'll be able to qualify under the easy form, 8% will not be able to, and then 23% are not sure yet. Um, I did not include what anything about the more detailed application. Um, basically, you're just going to have to calculate that FTE and also calc show the calculations for your beginning wages and your current wages to prove that you know what the wage reduction was or was not and then to prove up your fte calculation so it just goes into more detail all right so continuing on and i'm going to kind of breeze through the rest of this so that we can get to some q a we start at three o'clock yeah um so require documentation you know you're going to have to even even for the easy form you're going to have to provide a lot of documentation, bank statements, payroll reports directly from your payroll provider for the cover period or the alternative cover period, um, canceled checks, account statements showing like healthcare costs, retirement plan contributions. You know, I know for myself, I don't get um, any kind of documentation other than what we provide to the, the you know, when we make our contribution. So the bank said, yeah, just showing it on your bank statement where that contribution was paid um, is good. Uh, payroll tax forms, you're going to have to have all your, your 941s or T TWC form or other state unemployment forms. Um, and then you're going to have to document your FTE. And I'm not sure 
if there is a requirement to document your FTE reports for your baseline period and the cover period if you're doing the um, easy form. Um, so again, more documentation. If you're not on the easy form, you're definitely, well, I'm sorry, either way, you're going to have to show not only the documentation of your rent, utilities, lease payments that are covered, but you're also going to have to prove it up for February because it can't be new leases and new, you know, you can't just go out and buy a new car, put it on lease and have, you know, it all forget, not all, but have it forgiven the payments. So you got to show copies of all that stuff as well. Um, you do have to keep everything for six years. Okay. So just keep that in mind. Now, real quick, how do you account for this? I mean, we are the accountants, but that's not usually what we get online and talk about. Um, how do you account for it? We highly, highly, highly recommend. I think we only had one client and she had extenuating circumstances on um, not getting on, on getting a second bank account. We highly recommended a second a alternative bank account just to hold the PPP funds until those qualified expenses were incurred and paid. And then you use that bank account as, as and then you, you reimbursed yourself. So you did a transfer to reimburse for the expenses. That transfer was fully documented. That's how we did it. So highly recommend a separate bank account. It's kind of a moot point if you haven't already done that. So for the PPP expenses, we don't, our firm is taking the stance, we are not creating segregated expense accounts or even segregated classes or departments for PPP expenses. Our clients and the people we're working with are mostly letting it be spent on payroll. Most of them are, most everybody we've worked with said, hey, since the time frame's been expended, extended, we're just gonna spend it all on payroll. That way we don't worry about justifying all of our other expenses. We're just gonna spend it all on payroll. We are not going to segregate that out of the payroll expenses on the P&L statement. We are just going to keep it the same. The deposit that comes in, we recorded that on the books as a loan payable because that's what it is. As the money is transferred from the separate checking account into the main checking account, that's the only transaction we're recording a transfer from bank one to bank two, from PPP bank to the other bank account. Um, the, uh, and then at the end of the year, we, when, when, or not even the end of the year, when the loan forgiveness is granted, at that point, we will record a journal entry to, to, um, basically reclassify the amount forgiven and take it from the loan payable account to an other income account. And that's how we're going to account for it. We're not segregating out the expenses. We're not doing anything with the expenses. We're just going to have other income. It's going to be loan forgiveness and it's going to be in the bottom section of our P&L. And then whatever's remaining on the loan will stay there, which will be like your idle advance. So what if you didn't get forgiveness? Because there's a possibility that this is gonna happen. And um, if you did not get for 100% uh, forgiveness, that amount will stay as a loan payable. You do have two to or five years, if it's extended, um, to pay it off. It's at 1% interest. And those payments are deferred for like six months. And so um, depending on when you got the loan, and, and they did maybe make some changes with that Flexibility Act. It's gonna be, you know, your payments are gonna start coming due according to your amortization schedule. You'll start paying it back to the bank. Um, also, if you want, some people say, look, um, we, we don't even wanna pay it out on a loan. We didn't spend it all, and so we just wanna pay it back. Not a problem, right? Maybe you get ninety thousand in forgiveness, and you want to maybe you want to pay back the ten thousand dollar idle grant right then because you just don't want to mess with having a ten thousand dollar loan. Just like the bank doesn't want to mess with having a ten thousand dollar loan on their books, you can just pay it back at that time. There's no penalty to pay it early. Um, as part of that, not necessarily this slide, I, I kind of mentioned early on. The banks don't want these loans on their books, and so they would be happy if you paid it off early. 
And so what some updates that just came to me as of today and yesterday is that, so Paul and I were trying to get on it and get a forgiveness application process because we want to be able to speak about the reality of working through that and that's when the bank were like no we're not taking them banks you know what they, what they said to me was the bank the sba portals are not open yet to accept the forgiveness applications i said well wait a minute the bank is the one who accepts the application what he means is the application for forgiveness goes to the bank the bank makes a determination when they make their determination, they then submit it to the SBA to be reimbursed that money. Because remember, this is the bank's money. At this point, this money came from the bank, not from the SBA. The SBA is guaranteeing it. They did not provide it. And so that portal hasn't been opened up and the bank is not going to start offering forgiveness until it's getting its money from the SBA. Then it'll tell you, hey, the SBA paid us. We're good to go. You're forgiven. That's what's going to happen. Um, the, the small banks, they've got, a, they, you know, they've got their lobbyists up there and they're literally like, we worked with a very small Texas bank that did several loans for us and the president of their bank is on the Capitol Hill right now lobbying for some of this extra work to happen. So they're trying to push through this bill that would automatically grant forgiveness to any loans 150,000 and less. So if you're in that bucket, I mean, if, if forgiveness opens up, you, you want to apply for it, you've met all the qualifications, by all means, ask for forgiveness, but you may not even have to go through that work. Um, they quoted that, Paul, what was it, 86% of the loans issued, 80%, 80% of the loans issued, like the number of loans issued, are less than 150000 but that only represented 26% of the total dollars loaned out. So there's really strong support to make this happen. I can't say if it is, and if it is, I can't say when. Um, we're just treating them like, we're, we're kind of telling people, A, we got to hold off because banks aren't doing it right now anyways, and B, I mean, unless you just want to pay us to do it, and, and you know, my, we're, we'll do it, but let's wait. They may just issue a blanket forgiveness for anything lower than 150. Um, and again, they may be working, on, they're working on a bill to extend uh, it five more weeks. There's also talk, so there's like $129 billion that hasn't been spent out of the PPP bucket, that second tranche of funds that they gave. And so they're talking about kind of what I'm hearing, and Marco Rubio is very heavily involved in this, that let's extend it for five more weeks, or hey, let's just take 100 billion and do some other package for small, really targeted businesses that need it. Anytime they say that, I always think, I'm thinking restaurant hospitality, restaurants and hotels. I, it, it doesn't say that, but I'm wondering if that's what, it, what they mean. So what should you be doing right now? You need to be keeping your records. You guys are accustomed to this. You've got to keep good records. You've got to document everything you do. Um, familiarize yourself with the application. There's the application that's there. The instructions are there. That way you have an idea of what you need. Like Paul worked all day yesterday <clears throat> working on it. And one of our payroll providers we work with, um, the report we had been using check by check by check did not allow us to go in and 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 create that report for a date range for the whole period but we found another report that did so we're kind of figuring those things out so we know exactly what we're going to do when it comes time to uh, apply don't be afraid to ask for help we are here we are here to help um, we are only working again with this industry home health hospice that's not true we've got tommy turner worked himself in um he's a uh, does construction and so that industry is you know some of them have been hit really hard too but um i believe he is cousins with lisa selman holman as most of us know her so anyways we're helping him so we're, we're not we'll help anybody that we can um just send us an email and so then I think that's all we got. Here we are. I will say, again, I would highly recommend if you don't use YouTube that much, it's, you know, you might look into it, download it onto your phone, and then go subscribe to our channel and set, set your preferences that you get notifications to, of only channels you subscribe to. 
I don't put a lot out there, but that's where I'm going to be posting updates. Webinars always go there. So for some reason you missed um, one of our webinars, it's going to be there. But also I'm getting in the habit of just recording short little messages to get massive, to get information out to the masses, you would get a little pop-up saying, hey, Amy Knight recorded a new video, go check it out. So it's a really good way to stay on top of all the updates that just continue to flow out. All right, uh, there's my disclaimer again. So let's jump into questions. Uh, Paul, unmute yourself and uh, let's, and, and start feeding me some questions. Okay. Um. If vacation pay is included in the payroll cost, can I use accrued vacation as a payroll benefit? You can include any paid out PTO or vacation. Um, but like if you're accrued vacation, no, you cannot include the accrual of vacation as a benefit. No, uh, yeah, we're gonna, I'm gonna go with no on that one. I feel like I'm on Jeopardy, not Jeopardy, but okay. Uh, well, it's kind of similar. Can we count vacation hour of accrued but not pay towards forgiven payroll costs? You just answered that. Yeah, no, we cannot. Okay. Uh, is a new uh, Advantage Medicaid Relief Fund also to be applied with the bank like the PP, PPP loan application backed by SBA? Okay, and there's a couple of questions that looks like about HHS money, and I intentionally have now separated that into a separate um, webinar. So, Nathan, no, you actually apply through HHS for that, and Paul can help you, um, but... Um, but check your email. I am doing a webinar Wednesday, next Wednesday. It's going to be Aliyah Care and myself again, and we're doing strictly HHS provider relief funds to answer all of those questions. And um, and Aliyah Care is a Medicaid specific software, so she'll be on to help you figure out how to track lost revenues and things like that. So we'll dig into those then. Okay, if you have used your PPP loan funds unknowingly for payroll taxes, can you go back and uh, pay, pay that back and, and pay it for future payroll? I would highly recommend that you do that, yes. Um, and, you know, there's some very strong language in the act. If they wanted to get nasty, they might could come down on you for doing it. But I think if you, I, I think what I would do to be super cautious, I think I would document, like write a little memo to file kind of thing that says, oh my gosh, I just learned I was not supposed to do this. I have immediately repaid any payroll taxes that were paid back. Show your calculations and your supporting document to show that you made a mistake. Like I didn't mean to do that. And I'm, I'm making a good faith effort to correct it and then save those dollars for payrolls in the future. Okay. What's the implication of employee census being lower than projected? I think what you mean by lower than projected, so there was this big question because on the application for the PPP loan itself, it said employee count. And the problem with that, that was that number has nothing to do with what happens now. So what happens now, they're going to look at your real FTE count. And so if your FTE count is down compared to where it was pre-COVID, that's where you're going to start having a problem if you don't meet one of those exceptions. But if you're comparing it to that number you put on your application, it's not a problem. Okay. Uh, if half our attendants did not come back to work because they transferred to another agency, would that be able to be used for number two uh, exception on the EZ form? I think so because you offered the work. They voluntarily resigned. You've offered the work back or maybe you laid them off and then you can't, they won't come back and you haven't found replacements qualified for the position. So I think you'd be good. Uh, yeah, will y'all be doing the easy form for those that have hired you to get us through this process? Yeah, yeah, we are certainly not going to do the hard form if we can do the easy form. <laughs> yes, yes, we will. We will make sure. Uh, Pam, I, Pamela, I think, I think 
everybody that we're working with so far is going to qualify. And so we plan on doing the easy form for sure. So then somebody has a question about uh, okay. uh, FTEs rounding, if you say 19.3 versus 19.9. How does that how does that uh, affect the qualification of using the easy form? My non CPA side is coming out. Um, I, what do you think, Paul? And Paul, turn your camera on. Turn my camera on. <laughs> oh, it says I can't do it. Oh, okay. All right. Um, okay, go ahead. Continue on. I'm sorry. Well, I don't know. That's it's you know, do you round up or you round down? Or that, that's a. Uh, I don't know if that's ever been addressed anywhere in the guidance. Uh, I don't. Um, it hasn't. But my thought is, I think I would try it unless and unless the bank kicked it out. I mean, I don't know. That one's that one's awful close. Yeah, that's that's I. I'll, Paul I'll is go for it. That's what I'm. Paul's far more conservative than I am. All they can do is say no. You need to use the long form. But I and and any work that you do for the easy form is going to then be needed on the long form if if it doesn't qualify. I would I would go for it. Yeah. Uh, well, somebody wants to. Can you explain the FTE once more? Okay, I know I went over that really cool really fast. So your FTE count is basically going to, what I do is I take your payroll report for the, you know, say, say you're on a two week payroll period, you're biweekly, you have 10 working days or 14 working days, depending on how you count it. But you got two weeks of payroll, Take your total payroll hours and divide it by 80 hours because there are 80 work hours in the week. And so I know a lot of you guys do 24 seven care and a lot of you guys do weekends and on call and all that. Don't consider all that. Look at just a standard work week, 40 hours a week. It's a two week payroll. It's 80 hours. Okay. So don't overcomplicate it. So take your total payroll hours divided by 80. Now, if you're semi monthly, you really need to look at the calendar and look how many work days are there. You're either going to have 10, 11 or 12. So it's going to be 80 hours, 88 hours, or 96 hours. And you want to know that exact number for that pay period that you're evaluating. And so you're just going to take total hours and divide it by that number of hours in that period. Now, for instance, Paul and I are working on the whole period yesterday, and we want a report that shows us for the whole 10 weeks. Well, we had 10 weeks. At, at 40 hours a week, so we have 400 hours. So we took those total payroll hours divided by 400 hours. And what that's doing, that's getting you down to what's your average head count if you were to make everybody full-time equivalent, which is what FTE is. So I hope that helps. And you cannot pay off an old company car loan yeah. with your PPP. <laughs> but, but what you can do you let PPP pay, you know, for your payroll for eight, 10, 12 weeks, use the other money, your other revenue to pay off your old car. And then there's a, there's a question about uh, what if it goes over calendar year, 2020 <laughs> versus 2021? It will not because it's the shorter, well, right now, it's the shorter of 24 weeks or 1231, if I'm not mistaken. So I don't think anything's allowing it to go into 2021. And there's uh, so excess cash used as company wishes with no restrictions. Um, a little, here's here's my opinion on that. Um, the conservative approach to me is I would wait until. I would be very careful there. Um, there are no rules against it. However, I would be careful if they come looking at stuff. I, I just, I'm still worried about the buyer's remorse that the government might get. Um, I'm not as worried as much about it on PPP loan stuff as I am HHS. 
If you're getting HHS money, we need to be very, very careful about those things. Um, Diane, everything I see also says 1031. Um, it does say revised June. So the question is all the forms, uh, the forgiveness forms have an expiration date of 1031, which is super interesting because it was revised on 613. If you got 24 weeks, so I'm not sure. So as long as it says revised 613 or 616, that's the most recent form. Um, any news on the $2 million PPP, you will still be audited. And that means that the S, uh, my understanding is the SBA will actually review in detail your, um, all of your information. I don't know if I know anything different. So that looks like all the questions, but real quick, I'm gonna go check some of my little sources over here. I got some stuff. Uh, I'm just making sure, I, okay, nothing in chat. I'm just making sure no new updates. I will give you this statistic. Um, the SBA every week they're put, I think it's every week, they're putting out a, a summary of how the funds have been used and there's a percentage and it shows that healthcare and, a, and social assistance has received 12.93% of all dollars loaned out and that's the highest percent followed by professional scientific and technical services. I, I found that to be interesting. Um, so I don't see anything new to share with anybody. Uh, we do have a couple more questions that ca came in. Okay, go ahead, Paul. Oh, is there any guidance on bonuses for nurses? Can we give them any amount we want? So you can give them any amount that you want. You're just gonna have to be careful that the total amount paid to them fits within that $100,000 $100, cap. And so, you know, nurses can earn some money, especially if they're doing lots of extra visits and such. So we've seen some nurses run into that, a cap issue because a bonus was issued. Um, so now, again, I highly encourage you, remember you still have all this money that, um, I shouldn't say that blanketly, a lot of you are still operating on full um, service capacity. And if you still have revenue coming in from regular visits and services, give them the bonus if they deserve it. What's Ronnie got to say? Um, or uh, let me, any quote on HHS money, can this be used for payroll after PPP? Yes, Ruth, um, that can be used after the PPP money runs out. You can use it um, on payroll for sure. And again, look for my webinar next uh, Wednesday on that. Significant portion of the funds to bonus our employees to reward them for hard working during the COVID crisis. This changes, I want to use the bonus portion of the wages we pay to help cover the HHS funds we received. How will we handle this since the 941s are going to reflect all wages paid during the covered period? Um, that's a good question. Um, Ronnie, why don't you email me that and I'll, we'll walk through that because I have some thoughts, but it, it kind of gets, I don't, a lot of people know your name, so I don't want to just blast it on national TV. Um, again, I think that's it guys. So Ronnie, email me that question and link to the Medicaid webinar. Okay, hold on. Let me see if I can link that into the chat real quick to the, um, if you give me just a minute, I will. You know what I'll do? I'll, I'll include it in the follow-up email. Well, let me just get, it'll just take me a second to get it here. Let me just jump into Zoom. Okay, let me get this link real quick. And then chat, where did my chat thingy go? to all attendees. Okay, 
All right, just posted that link for the HHS Provider Relief Funds webinar next Wednesday in the chat box. Um, so everybody can go register for that. And are we going to be required to submit bank statements? I think so. Oh, well, Paul, what do you think for documentation? Well, it says either bank statements are payroll reports from the, from the payroll provider. Yeah, I, I don't think bank statements will be, be required just blanketly. I think it would be if you needed to use a bank statement to justify mm -hmm. any of your expenses, like, um, for instance, like a health retire, I mean, like a, a retirement plan contribution or, um, you know, your health benefits, even if it's auto drafted, you need to be able to go in and download the actual invoice, but maybe like your rent payment, you know, a lot of us, you're going to have to supply your, um, lease agreement, but they might also want to see the bank statement showing that it was actually paid, but probably not for payroll because you'll have the payroll reports to support yeah. that. So, all right, guys, that's all we got. I'm going to sit here and get everything wrapped up. I'll get the um, email put together to go out tomorrow with the recording. And I appreciate you guys listening and letting us help you through all of this. All right, how do I...